Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are in the world. Um, I'm Darren Byler, a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Asian Studies at the University of Colorado. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the third China Made Workshops, third session, and a uh, keynote talk from Abdul Malik Simone. Um, so we'll, we'll spend the first hour uh, with Abdul Malik, and then we'll move into a, a panel discussion. Um, so I'll start by introducing Abdul Malik. Um, Abdul Malik Simone is a senior professorial fellow at the Urban Institute um, at the University of Sheffield. He works on issues of spatial composition in extended urban regions, the production of everyday life for urban majorities in the global south, infrastructural imaginaries, collective affect, global blackness and histories of the present for Muslim working classes. He's the author of many books, including recent titles such as Improvising, Improvising Life, After Lives of an Urban South and Jakarta, Drawing the City Near. Um, he's also the author of a 2004 book, For the City Yet to Come, Urban Life in Four African Cities, which is how I first encountered his work. Um, at the time, I was an undergraduate and been reading a lot of heavy G to lose books um, and really been struggling to understand how to apply assemblage type thinking to real life situations, the sort of thing we've been talking about in the workshop over the, the previous two sessions. Um, and so when I picked up for the city yet to come and saw this being done, this assemblage thinking being done with so much clarity, it really struck a chord with me and reconfirmed to me, why I wanted to be a social scientist and not a philosopher. Um, and over the years, I found his work has shown me and, and a generation of scholars um, how to foreground attention to the material and the human together, and to think about both in relation to power and poetics. Um, he's an inspiration in, in so many ways. So it's for all of these reasons that it's crucial to think with his work when it comes to the emergent field of power that is carried by Chinese infrastructure, and, and which is really the focus of, of this entire week of, of panels. Um, so it's a great honor to have him with us today. Uh, the title of his talk is Becha Nikko, Manifold Routes to the Metropolitan in Indonesia. So please join me in welcoming virtually, however you wanna do that, uh, Abdul Malik Simone. Um. Thank you, Darren. Thanks for such a nice introduction, too. Um, okay. Um, yeah. Thanks for the thanks for the for the invitation. Um, thanks for the the work of this uh, of this project over over the years. Um, for all of the, the, the rich, uh, substantial kinds of work and reflections that have come out of that. I've, I've really learned a lot from reading uh, a, a lot of the, 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 the work that has been submitted. And uh, I, really, um, I really thank you for that. And uh, also thanks to, to Ari, uh, whose work I have been, has been really important to me over, over the years. Um, particularly as it marks its, um, its 20, 20th year. Um, today, I'm going to do something to, which, is a, which is much more of a kind of a sketch, um, a kind of heuristic sketch. Um, um, it's not a political economy. It's not a history, uh, even though uh, a really... Um, uh, uh, precise and intricate political economy is needed as well as a history. So I, but I'm not, I'm not going to, to, to do that today. What I'm trying to do is in some ways think about a plane of intersection um, that, uh, that is being constituted in, in, in Eastern Indonesia in ways in which particular kinds of trajectories are crossing each other uh, in terms of the incipient form of 
a particular kind of metropolitan space in, 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 in the making. Um, and so it is in some ways um, speculative um, and, and, and a sketch. So just with that, that kind of proviso in, in mind. Um, so it's three movements. So the first movement is, is depletion and, and displacement. Um, and it, so we start with, with the, the, the notion that, that Eastern Indonesia is increasingly um, at the center of, you know, try, of, of a so-called green extraction economy uh, with its extensive reserves of lithium, nickel, cobalt, rare earth metals that are needed for cathodes of lithium ion batteries. Um, so in some ways that the Eastern Indonesia is being in some sense configured as a kind of this, this global, new global center of, 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 green, of green extraction. And Chinese investment in mining operations underpin most of this, most of this, of, of, of this economy. Um, and in some ways it piggybacks on to an already uh, existent uh, stream of massive invest, continued massive investment in the Indo Indonesian uh, automobile production, uh, but now with the concomitant sense of trying to generate uh, large amount, large volumes of um, of, of EV vehicle, of, of electronic ve of vehicles. Um, so that in, in a sense that it's not just the extraction of raw materials, but the extraction is also coupled with this kind of sense of this, um, this imaginary of, of expanded and enhanced um, green centered uh, mat manufacturing. Uh, so Indonesian nickel production has grown from 100,000 tons of processed nickel in 2014 uh, to, you know, almost, you know, um, uh, venturing close to over a million tons expected by, by next year. Uh, Indonesia is scheduled to produce half of the world's nickel in the next two years. And 72 million tons of reserves have been announced at for assets uh, since 2016. Uh, nickel is a is a kind of funny material to to work with, uh, particularly because of its high moisture content that has to be dried out. And then traditionally, the the in traditional smeltering, the ore had to be melted down to at around 1500 degrees Celsius uh, for ore that contained less than 2% nickel. So massive amounts of ore had to be smeltered, which required large amounts of energy, which in the past have come largely from coal-fired power plants with its high high carbon carbon footprint, so in some way in some ways the, the the attempt to extract the particular kind of material that is needed in order to reduce global carbon footprint itself required uh, a, a high expenditure of energy. That so in in, in some sense this is a kind of a, a kind of double double bind. Now. Nickel is found in, in two types of deposits, uh, nickel laterites and magmatic sulfide deposits. It's the laterite nickel that, that's our dominant in Indonesia, uh, partly because uh, it's of its location to the surface, uh, but its smeltering is more difficult compared to the magmatic sulfide ore. So the bulk of, of Indonesian uh, nickel production so far has been in terms of sort of the cheap nickel of, you know, oftentimes called nickel pig, pig iron. Now increasingly to be able to extract nickel and cobalt, which are used for battery components, uh, the laterite ore needs to undergo a, a kind of new form of processing, which is called uh, high pressure acid leaching. 
And this process produces mud waste called tailing, and this waste is laden with toxic heavy metals such as, such as ar arsenic. So each year, mining companies dump some 220 million of hazardous mine waste, known as tailings, directly into oceans, rivers, and lakes. And tailings are the sludge that remains once the mineral is extracted from the ore, and it contains processing chemicals and naturally occurring elements, such as arsenic that become toxic when exposed to air or water. And this dangerous cocktail smothers fragile organisms living on the sea floor. And the tailings can also spread contaminating sea life consumed by residents and destroying coral reefs and other habitats. And so in terms of the, of the, the expand, expanded uh, uh, extraction and processing of nickel, particularly in Eastern Indonesia, uh, more and, and more of seabeds, particularly off the western coast of Halmahera and the North Moluccas, are being designated as recipients, receptacles for, for such tailing, tailings, and thus, you know, of course, disrupting an entire uh, aquatic uh, ecology that uh, many residents have been dependent upon for a long time. Um, so this map gives you the, 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 the kind of geography of where most uh, nickel extraction sites are, are located, the bulk of them uh, within eastern, southern eastern Sulawesi, but increasingly shifting toward the, the Moluccas and toward off the coast of, uh, of, west, of west Papua. And as you can see, the 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 bulk of 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 the of the pig iron the pig uh, nickel pig iron projects underway uh, are largely uh, Chinese led, although in in partnership with with Indonesian companies, but largely with with Chinese money and and technical expertise. And on the on the first day of the workshop, we 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 did hear a, a presentation already on the Morawali Industrial Park uh, in Sulawesi, um, and you know the names of the companies of uh, again largely dominated by by Chinese firms, um, but the but the rationale of this uh, always being enlarged industrial park has given uh, the, the, the Chinese largest production producer of stainless steel, Qingzhong, a significant cost reduction by largely moving processing from China to Sulawesi, tapping into cheap Indonesian labor and shortcutting lengthy bureaucratic procedures in both countries. But more, more importantly, um, this gives um, Xinxian guaranteed access to nickel concessions, which insulate production from international price fluctuations, political disputes, and the likelihood of export bans, which are at least officially already un underway. Uh, so a key part of the investment incentive for Chinese firms is to exclusively access the domestic nickel supply in exchange for investments in processing technologies. Um, so again, this is just, I mean, just, um, you can't really see this, but I mean, it just gives you a sense of the, of the complexity of the, of the processing uh, procedure through this kind of acid leach technology um, and even though it uses far less energy than smeltering processes, again, the, the, the tailing, tailings management um, um, is not without significant kind of ecological footprints. But what here, here what, what I want, want to point out is important is that it will take 60 to 80,000 metric tons every year for the next 20 years if EV manufacturers are going to meet their electrification goals. So in some sense, the, 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 as, as this kind of green, green uh, transport economy expands, the, the, the exigency to identify more and more sources of, of nickel also 
expand in, in terms of the volume that's necessary in, in order to generate uh, this as a kind of viable, I think viable sector. Um, just again, some, some basic, uh, basic information on the, the degrees of, of interlinkages, uh, the, the, the number of smelters under construction, um, uh, it's backward and forward link, linkages in terms of, of other ancillary economies. Um, so that in, in some sense, the, the, the Chinese companies are trying to offset some of the, the ecological implications of their investments through at least a kind of formal commitment to build solar and wind plants, um, because in some sense, smeltering has depended so largely on, on coal-fired fired power. Um, so you can see in some sense the, the, the extensiveness of the kind of processing, uh, processing op op operations. Now, this, is, this, this expansion of, of Chinese capacity uh, and of concessions is, is also coincides with the, the, the recent uh, passage of what's, what was called the omnibus law, the very controversial omnibus law of, of last year, uh, which in some sense under the auspices of job creation, basically threw everything in the kitchen sink into one legislative vehicle to really in some sense rework a large number of things around land status, around ownership, around concessions, around basically the, the entire operations of, 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 of Indonesia's platform for, for extractive economies. And, and under the omnibus law, the power of mining companies has substantially increased uh, with the elimination of royalty payments on guarantee and importantly, the criminalization of residents who attempt to protest mining, mining operations. Uh, the central state, uh, again, assumes inordinate control as the kind of chairman of the board of mining operations. Uh, it weakens the position of existing environmental impact uh, legislation as mining is now increasingly allowed in protected forest and water conservation areas and almost no room for community participation in terms of the, of the, of the disposition of, of both con, uh, mining concessions, manufacturer processing, and anything having to do with the kind of actual management of these, of, of these sites. So in, in some sense, the residents are completely in some sense, margin, completely marginalized from having any kind of impact in terms of modulating the impact of these infrastructures on the, the areas in, in, in which they, they live. Um, and to further develop, you know, in terms of the electronic vehicle sector, you know, Jokowi can now issue presidential decrees on anything from import exemptions, unlimited road use and no caps on unavailable loans. Um, in part, the, the, the re-centralization of this kind of managerial capacity within the ambit of the central state was at least on paper a response to existing legislation that had permitted Indonesian provincial governments and regions to grant their own uh, their own uh, mineral um, concessions uh, to Indonesian firms and, and, and small mining groups. So you basically had a kind of uh, network of very decentralized issuing of permits and concessions uh, that, was, that was found to be completely un 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 unwieldy. So in other words, the variety of state units in the past could differentially determine which areas could be designated for mining and which market players to allow. Uh, this led to uh, permitting powers, to, this led to a rapid expansion of large scale mining firms and artisanal mining groups in the country 
as local authorities just ran over each other chasing mining projects. Um, but but um, the, you know, in, in, in terms of, of being, of it was pushing extraction beyond the, the government's oversight capacity, uh, but much more than just simply the oversight capacity, the, their, their ability to, in some sense, coordinate and strategically develop the sector within its own, within its own ambit. Um, so again, uh, a kind of listing of, of, of different, different smelters. Um, now, in the, 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 gover the Indonesian government did, had issued a decree that raw ex exports of nickel would cease uh, this past year in order to force domestic smeltering. Uh, the ban would cover ore exports, uh, exports with nickel content uh, below 1.7%, which combined with the 2014, 2014 ban on higher grade net nickel exports would basically halt all nickel ore exports from the country. Um, this had ramifications for, uh, in terms of the financial aspects of, of the sector. Um, but revisions to that mining legislation permitted a four-year window of nickel ore exports in return for investment in downstream processing capacity. Um, this, in addition to the, to the omnibus law of 2020, uh, additionally inhibited both large-scale firms and smaller groups from selling in far, far foreign markets, which allowed newly relocated Chinese smeltering firms with huge smelting and processing capacity to now dominate the demand side and dictate the nickel price at very cheap rates. Um, so this inadvertently created an oligopsony where both big and small firms are cutting corners in order to make up for lost profit and passing on the social environmental costs onto Indonesian uh, communities uh, and environments. But meanwhile, nickel ore continues to find its way to China, nevertheless, primarily through a workaround where nickel deposits that are embedded in laterites, primarily composed of iron, are exported in, as iron ore, but imported into China as nickel. Uh, and this, coupled with a range of other exemptions, maintain a sort of steady stream of, of, of nickel exports. So it, in, in some ways, everyone basically gets, it, gets to have their cake at the moment and, and, and eat it too, uh, in terms of, of being able to, the Indonesians being able to compel uh, a kind of massive development of the of the processing sector, uh, while at the same time allowing for these kind of under the table workarounds, which still enable uh, certain sectors, a, section, a certain volume of raw ore to be to be uh, imported. But again, with 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 really massive implications in terms of of land tenure uh, arrangements, uh, the, the, the wide expansion of nickel production in Halmahera particularly already upset, upsets an already volatile uh, uh, social compact of different kinds of uh, settlement arrangements uh, amongst different kinds of, of, of ethnic and religious groups uh, in a region that has experienced um, um, intense uh, conflict over land and resources in the past. Uh, and this expansion of, of, of nickel capacity within Halmahera particularly uh, promises to induce even more intense levels of, of volatility within a kind of legal framework, which, which basically prohibits residents from seeking any kind of recourse in terms of, of trying to define and modify the ways in which these investments do take shape. 
uh, and then the ecological fallout from the way from the the the, the manufacturing process. Um, the 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 irony in, in all, all of this is that in some ways uh, the, 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 the particular format of mining operations actually reduces the volume of, of plants which themselves contain nickel uh, that are called hyperaccumulators. That is in some ways the, it is possible, it is possible to develop uh, technological processes, which can, in some sense, avoid a lot of the, the worst environmental impact of, of nickel production as it now stands. Uh, but the problem is, is that the, the expansion of these kinds of conventional forms of nickel extraction and processing actually greatly diminish this kind, what could constitute a, a real form of green extraction um, that uh, that that is in some sense not then allowed to take place. So there's a kind of cruel irony uh, in the designation of these kind of green extraction economies uh, that really miss a kind of opportunity to to do something to do just to do something differently. Uh, particularly because uh, the the traditional mining as a whole has is still remains a kind of considerable uh, carb carbon carbon emitter. All right, so this is just in some sense to to lay the the basis for uh, this the the implications and the 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 the, the, the technical political. Uh, basis of this kind of massive expansion of um, so-called green extraction within, within East, East, in Eastern in Indonesia, just targeting, identifying some of the key components of that, of that, of that, of that move. So second movement, movement num num number two. So it's, it's 3.30 in the morning and halfway between Ambon and Sarong in Eastern Indonesia on the 42 hour PT ASDP ferry. In the upper deck, there are some 200 young men and women animated on cheap sugary coffee in the midst of an extended argument about the best way to make a living. Some are heading for both contracted and non-contracted work in the oil and mining. Others are returning from stints as casual labor in Kupong in Makassar with boxes of assorted goods barely intact after weeks on various ferries. The atmosphere is tense as exhausted bodies banter, cajole and provoke about which of them is more eligible to have access to what kinds of opportunities and resources. They argue about which forces and actors are primarily responsible for their sense of precarity for the multiple disruptions and uncertainties facing their families and communities. The talk is intensely racialized. Who can be trusted? Who is most complicit with the predominant threats posed? Which religion or ethnicity most associated with corrupt politicians or military officials? Who is a real Indonesian and who is not? Or whether that even matters. The upper deck of the ferry assembles a cross section of almost the entirety of East Indonesia. People from the Malakas, K Islands, Limbata, Alor, Flores, Nusa Tenggara Timor, West Papua, as well as Javanese and Minahasans. With the exception of the latter, these youth are often called Melanesians, a loose term for designating blackness, but with little overarching coherence or consensus. Although increasingly ascendant, blackness is an infrequent term of self-attribution, but one through which others are denigrated or emplaced. It is invoked to describe who one is either against or allied under continuously shifting circumstances. For in this region, Identity is as fluid and turbulent as the sea. 
the youth gathered have an underlying appreciation that they are all in the same boat, despite their sometimes wild claims of having the upper hand. At times, racially inflected provocations seem intentionally leveled as a means of eliciting rejoinders full of potentially, po full of potentially replete with useful information where anticipated self-defense might give away something. For everyone seeks something from each other, confirmation about impressions, tips about possible work opportunities, assessments about conditions in particular places or work sites, all of the ins and outs about how to more successfully manage lives on the move. Despite the expressions of resentment, superiority and suspicion, these protracted exchanges constitute the medium through which those gathered slowly make their way toward each other, identify grounds of possible complementarity, forge all kinds of temporary alliances that result in the sharing of access to specific places to reside, to work, to get access to services, documents and consumables, and exhibit unanticipated solidarities with exploitative bosses. Many of those gathered have indeed known each other for years. The vociferousness of some of the exchanges reflects their taking the space of the ferry as an opportunity to rehearse the solidity of ties in face of their anticipated vulnerabilities in face of a larger audience, as well as a duplicity intended to provide some cover for their intricate collaborations with each other. Those that are strangers are thus lured into speaking their minds, revealing something of themselves through the performance of the well-worn rituals of ethnic, religious, and racial insult. It is an opportunity to size up potential collaborators and companions, a means of pushing through all of the parochial and tribal allegiances in order to figure the tentative operations of a collective life in movement, stretched across great physical and cultural differences. When these youth disembark in Sarong and spread out to various sites of extraction in West Papua, in a region that is one of the most colonized in the world, in terms of its erasure of the lives and aspirations of the indigenous population, there will be a proliferation of WhatsApp messages that relay impressions and informations in ways that constitute a kind of grassroots articulation of these places. What you seem to fear most is to get stuck in some dead end situation without a viable way out. So a dispersed infrastructure of care unfolds and in part because these all night gatherings on an ASDP ferry going east acts as an albeit distorted deliberative body intent on exercising its fears and anxieties so as to propel their way into multiple alignments. These alignments distribute the necessary obligations across the very real differences in background and deter any accruing a sense of indebtedness at the same time. So as the sun emerges and youth drift off in exhaustion to wait and await another long day at sea, Ati, a 20 something man from Ambon concludes, we will all leave black brothers and sisters. So in some sense, what I'm trying to, to, to get at in this, in this story is, is a sense of of the way, the way in which these, these extraction economies um, from nickel to uh, palm oil production to copper mining to uh, pearl bed uh, harvesting, all of these sort of extraction economies, which in some sense have, have had a kind of uh, depleting effect on on particular kinds of, of land and particular kinds of agrarian economies uh, have had an effect on displacement, uprooting particularly youth from uh, any sense of a viable horizon in place, uh, compelling a kind of circulation. Um, what become the kind of venues, what become the kind of platforms through which one begins to try to think of a kind of collective life in, in movement. 
um, because in some ways these are youth that are continuously on the move, um, primarily across short-term contracts, if any contract at all, um, since many of these movements themselves are completely speculative. Uh, it's people taking a chance without, in some sense, any clear idea about what might happen at a, at a particular destination. And so use this kind of process of trying to figure out some sense of a kind of collective, a collective sense of a, a, a collective sensibility as a way of cultivating a kind of destination, materializing a kind of destination, whether that destination be uh, Kupang, uh, Makassar, uh, Sarong, uh, or, or, or other places. Now, many of these youth have been on the move for years and some move back and forth between their places of origins. Others simply move from one underpaid position or half-baked money-making scheme after another. But wherever they land temporarily, their increased numbers are filling up the expanding coastal cities across the region, as well as the towns and villages that surround mines, plantations, pearl beds, fish processing centers, and natural gas installations. Seldom settling in definitively anywhere, their circulations across different territories, occupations, compositions of residents, resource accumulation, and institutional affiliations, that, 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 the, very, that the very stuff of these circulations, how you circulate, the, where, the way they're, they're doing it, what they try to, in some sense, configure along the way, give rise to their own regional articulations, which coincide in sometimes complicit and antagonistic ways to the articulations occasioned by burgeoning extractive economies. So if one, if one thinks of a kind of, of a kind of materialized, expansive metropolitan space, a kind of form of urbanization that is taking a place across Eastern Indonesia, a region which one in no way would think con as conventionally urbanized. But if one thinks within the kinds of the notions of extended urbanization, the kinds of interlinkages between operational landscapes, uh, if you think within this kind of Lefebvrean sense of, of urbanization, can one also see the, the, the notion of, of circulating youth and their practices as a kind of other track of this kind of unfolding metropolitan space that sometimes coincides, sometimes diverges from that which is simply in terms of the operational landscapes of of, of, of extraction. So these youth deploy themselves as dis disposable income for tenuous and increasingly tense affiliations back home and beyond, and that these affiliations are, are that are only partly familial. Uh, so for example, if you, if, you, if you look just, if you look at the way in which um, movement is rooted, for example, in a, in a like in Limbata where where, where, where communities basically are only a decade out of completely barter economies. You know, the, even the notion of a cash economy is somewhere. And if, you, and if you look at the kind of complex relations of indebtedness through which of people who live within these communities, two or three may be designated to, to move. Uh, and how do they move? Well, it entails very complex relations amongst blood relatives, clans, local sponsors, and authority, authority figures. So in some sense, the, 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 that circulating youth isn't on his or her own, but embodies uh, and carries with him or her uh, the kinds of configurations of very intricate kinds of, 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 of relationalities. So for the places they come from hover with uncertainty between long home practices of bartering economies and the not yet fully instantiated economies of cash. As major retail and wholesale corporations increasingly dominate agricultural production and cycles all the way down to the field 
and as large investors from Jakarta and beyond swallow up large tracts of land on and offshore in formerly remote locales, and as the plantation system returns to consolidate individual landholding, as already dry climates face further reductions in wet seasons, and as larger amounts of small-scale agricultural production is left to older women, the stage is set for a preponderance of youth riding fast and loose, whether it's riding the high seas or it's riding, you know, uh, motor motorbike taxis in Kupang, uh, where the the motorbike becomes a kind of fast and loose residence for many youth who have no discernible home, uh, but the motorbike becomes the way in which they can negotiate their, available, their availability to one scheme or another, from theft to driving things around to smuggling to, you know, to, 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 to whatever. And of course, all youth, they come from where appeared migrants of reworked households from which they've been sometimes excluded, sometimes made unwilling centers of. They were sometimes the one on whom extended family hopes were placed ones designated not to work the fields or for those whom fields were already overcrowded or fallow. Some were designated as those who could best do without, whether it be a parcel of land, a spouse, a normal future, so that the meager savings of households could be applied to those seen as more vulnerable. So the strength of these youth, that why they were picked to do the traveling, to do the moving, oftentimes was then immediately converted into a deficiency in terms of their participation in larger labor markets in which they only had a temporary footing. As I said, a little bit of driving here, a little bit of delivering, a little bit of constructing, a little bit of repairing or servicing, but again, remaining fundamentally unsettled in terms of either home or occupation. So, Circulations of youth constitute a critical locus of logistics that in turn substantiate the elaboration of a form of metropolitan development that encompasses the existing major urban and extracting centers of Indo Eastern Indonesia. Major investments in infrastructure, particularly in extraction writ large, occasion the deployment of experiments with blackness as a critical means through which circulating youth attempt to activate a sense of distributed collective life in line with a distributed dispersed metropolitan form. It may even be possible to consider in this instance blackness itself as a kind of logistical operation in that it is being deployed as a means to link disparate genealogies and forms of identification into an operational sense of we, but without necessarily seeking to answer, anchor or consolidate itself into a specific historical narrative or political agenda. So in somehow it remains in some sense logistical. Then uh, in, the, my, in the last, uh, in the last uh, movement uh, here, um, the dispersed metropolitan in the key of black. So I'll try to run through this quickly because I recognize that I'm running out of time. So, um, Sarong in West Papua is one of the fastest growing cities in Indonesia. It is viewed as the center of the modernization projects of West Papua. An attempt by the Indonesian state to settle once and for all questions about its legitimate inclusion in Indonesia, while the political aspirations of Papuans for self-determination remain severely repressed. The construction of a Trans-Papuan Highway Network is further opening up the province to even more mines and plantations. Infrastructure is clearly perceived by native Papuans as a military weapon. Sarong is one of Indonesia's most cosmopolitan cities in demography, if not always in atmosphere, and is the largest constellation of a so-called Black Melanesian population, largely Christian, in contrast to the majoritarian Muslim identification of Indonesia, with residents from Ambon, Northern Sulawesi, Kai, Arawak Islands, and Nusa Tenggara, Timur. Now, they bring with them particular skills and orientations cultivated by their original locales and the colonial shaped expressions they were allowed to take. 
So some are ex-fighters, brawlers, drivers, thieves, mechanics, tricksters, marketeers, and seafarers. The solidity of any consolidation of ethnicities and regionalisms into a black identity waxes and wanes. It shows up and dissipates according to the situation or place at hand and who and what is being contrasted or enjoined. It is particularly enjoined in attempts to counter the substantial state subsidized influx of Muslims from Java. So there are times, for example, with when Ambonese and, and Papuans are aligned within a kind of notion of blackness that only momentarily shows itself in relationship to sort of emerging Javanese hegemony in the city. But on all, all other instances, they won't see themselves as having anything perhaps in common, common at all. Sarong has an overwhelming young population and schools and churches, mosques and clubs are teeming with different experiments with words, performances, sensibilities, and tensions. So it is a dynamic place in, in that sense. The growing articulations between NTT, Maluku and West Papuan provinces substantiates a vast new metropolitan region of interlinked populations, migratory flows, I mean, everything that I've been, I have been talking about uh, so far. Again, the, uh, I've, 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 I've covered this. So though it may be no more, but the profusion of various words for designating blackness on their lips, such tropes provide an accessible discourse of mediation between accounting for perceptions of exclusion, disqualification, and their determinations to successfully function in a larger world in their own terms, which largely need to be invented. So that is, how do, how do these particular kinds of ethnic groups who already in, in some sense are operating within urban worlds beyond the limit of those ethnicities, how do they, how, what, with what kind of vernacular do they see their positionality within a kind of larger world of, of operations? And so while caught in oppressive contexts of hypermilitarization, systematic attempts by governing regimes to divide and rule, and seductions into the highly particularized practices of sects and micro-territories, youth do try to configure new spaces of operations with it, uh, each other if not necessarily a belonging. So again, this kind of logistical notion of operations rather than a kind of, uh, of a settlement of, that's attached to belonging. And vulnerable to manipulation and the extraction of their energies and ideas, blackness does seem particularly well suited for pointing to solidarities that are being continuously worked out that remain unembedded in line with the logistical universes these youth try to, uh, these youth try to, 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 to navigate. And that's it. I'm sorry if I, I ran a little bit over time, but yeah, thanks a lot. Wow, what a talk. Um, and I don't think you really ran over time at all. Um, so it's right on time. Um, the floor is open for questions if people have them. Um, feel free to pop them into the chat or to raise your hand and I'll call on you. Um, one of the, I guess I'll start by asking a question about uh, the logistics of, of or blackness as a logistical operation. Um, so uh, you're saying that, that blackness is something that people don't necessarily own for themselves. It's a term of denigration. Um, but at the same time, they're operationalizing it um, in a whole range of different ways. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit more. What, how does, is blackness working as a kind of invisibility at times, like being a, a population that's not being uh, fully legible in the eyes of the state you know, through this movement and the temporary kind of labor? Um, and in what ways are they linking up with other uh, kinds of, of, of Black cultural formation um, in the, the urban context that you're talking about as well. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I think I, I think with, with 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 for 
for for youth who 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 can who now are 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 in some sense forced to 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 circulate and to circulate without a kind of clear sense of it's not that it's not that it's not it, it, I mean at one point you know youth from Ambon would come to Jakarta and and they they'd work as security at nightclubs I mean they they you would implant yourself as a kind of uh, in a in a place uh, and and stake your your life there, um, and to some extent that still that still continues not so much with Jakarta but with Makassar, but there is a there is an increased sense that you you're you're not migrating from one place to another and putting all of your eggs in that basket. Um, there is a sense that. Uh, that the circulation is a kind of scoping operation. Uh, it's the sense that where can you where can you find the where can you find opportunities? Uh, it, there becomes a kind of increased impatience with taking what's on offer, uh, and the sense that you keep moving because you're not gonna, you're not willing to stick at something for ten years or five years. Um, that coupled with the sense of why am I being displaced? What's, hap what, what's, what's, what's happening to the area in which I thought I was going to operate in? Um, and so there is a kind of in, more intense recognition of the region's marginalization and you know, margin historic marginalization in relationship to the nation, a marginalization that is cre increasingly understood in racial terms rather than religious or ethnic terms, because the circulation itself creates all these multiple exposures that, I mean, it's not, it's not that in East Eastern Indonesia historically, there's been a, you know, long histories of cir circulation. It's not that this is anything new, but there is a kind of sense of being exposed to others that are in a similar situation and then asking the question, what is it that we are, have in common? And blackness becomes a kind of available trope in which to think about that. About, about that. Um, so in, in that sense, a kind of logist, a logistical operation to try to work things through, you know, what would, what would, what would enable us to be in some kind of connection to each other and what explains the reason why we feel this sense of, of, of marginalization. On top of this, the Indonesian state itself is deploying these notions of not necessarily blackness, but Melanesianness as a kind of locus of commonality, which they are deploying instrumentally to justify the inclusion of West Papua within the Indonesian state. So the Indonesians can tell, can, 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 the Indonesians can, can say to, you know, the Solomons and to New Zealand and to Australia and to Papua New Guinea, you know, look it, we, you know, Papuans are Melanesian, Ambonese are Melanesian, Flores are Melanesian, we're, we're basically black. So we already have a black population. So there's no reason why the West Papuans based on some kind of distinct racial grouping should use that as a way to operate outside the nation. After all, we already are all Melanesians here in Eastern Indonesia. So the state is also using this kind of notion of identity instrumentally, which then in some ways, who owns that then? So it becomes a struggle of who, who owns blackness in its um, in its strategic in its strategic deployment, and of course, this is all like within Sarong, within the church clubs, you know, you know, and and it's in the church clubs mostly, <coughs> which bring together different kinds of youth from from diff different origins, and a lot under the auspices of hip hop, and and American black culture, which becomes a kind of easy way to. To think through these kinds of um, appropriations and deployment of, of, of blackness, you know, cult culturally, in terms of, of 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 sensing some kind of we're all in the same boat. Uh, 
that's great. Uh, questions from the audience? Sure, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, I, I just I put it in the uh, I put it in the chat a little bit, but um, and and I tend to think about these things through a kind of a Chinese cultural lens. So um, apologies for that, but I guess I'm just curious about um, the extent to which the state or other actors invest um, this kind of co collective youth life of youth movement with a discourse of improvement or you know something around along those lines of you know in which these kind of extens expansive metropolitan spaces um, would be thought of as the kind of a space that people need to gravitate to to um, uh, improve their own um, well in Chinese we would say quality but um, their own uh, life chances livelihoods that this is something necessary and that that circulation is something that they should be um, embracing. I think I, I don't I don't I don't know enough about that to be precise, but from what I do know, there I there is I think this this sense that comes through in terms of the messages of provincial and local and, and 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 local government that in in some ways the 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 future of a new generation uh, is with its its youth. The youth can't stand still. They should be moving. Uh, and uh, and I think you know the the at least officially the kinds of in, investment that are taking place in Sarong and Kupang most most particularly, um, I think it does reflect the state's sense that you want to cultivate a kind of new generation of urban of young urbanized. Uh, and I think, and, and what I do know is this is complemented with these kinds of affirmative action policies so that there's uh, a, lar a larger amount of investment in terms of subsidizing the university studies of young people from the East, uh, from Ambon, from Flores, uh, from NTT. Um, so I, 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 I I, I, it's a great question. I think that this is a this is really a, a key area to really investigate, to in, in, investigate further, um, particularly as as the state I think recognizes increasingly the 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 elevated sense of of hostility, um, uh, particularly I guess particularly manifested against the increased flows of, of, of Javanese investment and, and settlement within these areas. But it's a great question, Tim. I think it's really, this is really a, a key area of, of future work. We have one time for one more question. Uh, Tim Bunnell, do you, want, do you want to ask your question about intersecting prospecting? Yeah, I was just, so so many things I, I would like to ask, but um, just just this issue of, of, of what the people themselves refer to their mobility as. We, we know that there are terms in in Bahasa Indonesia and in also many of the local languages, including Maranto, is a big literature on that. But I was also thinking about partly connecting to work on futures, but also obviously the obvious metaphor in relation to mining as well as uh, is is prospecting. You know, um, what 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 kind of what kind of lexicon is there amongst the people themselves, and and you know, is is there some way in which we can differentiate what's going on here from from earlier literatures trying to uh, encapsulate um, young people's mobilities and uh, and desires to return to someone else and, and something else? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I think I think certainly. Uh, uh, Marantau continues to exist as a kind of organizing vernacular trope, um, but I think it varies. I mean, some 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 youth clearly see themselves on a mission. Uh, it's the, uh, the 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 a mission, uh, an obligation. Uh, a uh, I don't remember the word in in in. Uh, 
but when I was talking about before that that in some ways they they embody these kinds of complex relationalities that are, are invested in them as the as the very instrument of the development of their of their communities of origin. Um, so in some sense, it's sort of this 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 in betweenness of performing a kind of diplomacy. Of, of performing the kind of embodiment of the, of the aspirations, the, the capacity, the willingness of the places in which they, they come from. Um, and others that just see them, just see themselves as, you know, uh, kind of preyman on the run, you know, uh, brokering whatever they can, wherever they can. So I think it's quite it's quite over over determined uh, uh, in terms of how they, and it is this kind of over determination in some ways which makes these kinds of working out between different youth work out because there's a different sense of what they're doing, and so you can forge these kinds of complementarities, not only based on what kind of access that different youth might have to particular occupations or opportunities, but having different access to the different sensibilities that inform these kinds of circulations, their own sense of what it is that they're, that is that they're attempting to, to do. <coughs> but Tim, it's, I mean, it's important to, I think, trace this out really precisely given Eastern Indonesia historically for centuries being, this kind of place of circulation, of, of intersection. Um, and I think it'd be, it's important to, to be, try to be more precise about what this moment is historically in relationship to this, to this past. Great. Oh, I, at the risk of running a little into our next panel, maybe we can have one final question from Rachel Sylvie. Uh, about the, the connection between blackness and, and gender and sexuality. Uh, do you want to ask your question, Rachel? Sure. Uh, I, I'm just so blown away by this talk and um, the connections that you're making. And um, I keep thinking about this as a kind of frontier of subjectivity and how it's an embodied frontier that uh, and I was wondering on the boat, how are how is sexuality and gender played out kind of between the young women and the young men who are traveling? And if you want, want to say a little bit about that in relation to blackness. I think you're muted, uh, Malik. This is this is a critical question, which I I really, I really need to know more on um, there. From what from what I've able to see in this sort of limited, I mean, the the thing about the 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 the, the COVID thing is, I was supposed to have been the whole year uh, basically in Sarong, um and wasn't able to do this. Besides this kind of a kind of initial period of of, of field work about a year and a half ago. Um, are the complementarities, of, of course, that 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 somehow exist um, in 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 Sarong itself? I mean, it is black women that are the ones that are invested in in terms of education. Um, it is for it is. I mean, this typical kind of it is a typical kind of racial gendered conjunction where. Black women, uh, youth are seen as those that are more responsible, more stable, more sedentary, and more worth being invested in, in terms of, of, of education. On the run, on the move, uh, young women oftentimes are the ones that hold the money, uh, the ones who in some ways manage things, manage disbursement, manage savings, manage, um, uh, identify particular places to stay, temporary accommodation, negotiating that. Um, so there are these kinds of repetitions of gendered 
divisions of, of, of labor continue to be wrapped up with the, with the sense of, of, of women's capacity to be more, to be more stable, even, even uh, on, on the run. Um, I mean, the, 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 it, is prim it is still predominantly a, a, a male world of circulation. Uh, but I think inc increasingly there are um, younger women also on the move, uh, traveling in, in different kinds of constellations of, 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 constell of different crews, you know, constellations of, of mixed gender, sometimes with family members, sometimes intentional family members. Uh, but again, it's Rachel. It's a it's a it's a key question and a key area to to further look at. Great, thank you so much for a, a great talk and and a great.